Hi, my name is Donna Marie Glashen. I'm the production manager for the World Power Festival. And Donna Marie, uh, for those people who don't know what this festival has involved for you, can you give us a sense of exactly what you've been doing and what people can expect over the next four weeks during the month of October? Um, this festival, the Literature Festival and the Book Fair has taken over, I'd say, about 10, 11 months for us to actually plan and organise. Um, it's actually been a vision of our directors for, I reckon, about 10 years. But the actual day-to-day -day planning, the seven days a week and late evenings that we've been doing, contacting so many people and actually not just us contacting, but people contacting us, wanting more information and just making sure everything's correct and contacting the writers, reading people's books, um, arranging all the media. Yeah, it's been a lot. And what kind of writers have you been going for? I mean, there are many who are known from the 70s and 80s, from the States and from the Caribbean and from the continent of Africa. And of course, there's a new blood coming through uh, from the new millennium and beyond. I mean, what kind of note have you tried to strike? Um, well, I must say we actually have a steering committee and there were many late evenings spent discussing what writers we should invite and arguments, you know, for the for and against, you know, why we should actually use them. Um, you know, how much resistance, how much <laughs> politics, how much protest and how much just yeah. rhythm and entertainment. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of that involved, but what it really came down to, we, first of all, I mean, especially to do with the British writers, it was all about how much talent and how much commitment they actually have to the community and to improve in education. I mean, that played a major part. Um, when it came to international artists, we wanted to go with people who um, were well kind of known, but probably not so commercial and highlight their achievements and what they've, you know... So more kind of conscious, a bit more Garveyite as opposed to the kind of people who sell huge amounts of units but it's all commercial? Yes. Yeah, that sums it up, Henry. <laughs> so what kind of pitch did you make to the likes of uh, Muta Baruka or Anthony T. Browder or did they not take much persuading when I mean, they were pretty committed anyway? Actually, they were pretty committed. Centre Prize has been going for 37 years um, and it started with literature and it started with publications. So these people, they have um, connections with Centre Prize from, you're talking 10, 20 years ago. So a lot of them, once they heard it was on, they were you know, more than willing. All it was was if they were available, the dates, the times. Yeah. And because they're conscious, they wanted to participate in something like this, which is you know, a black literature festival and it's its only kind in Europe. So. And, um what are the similarities or indeed differences between this and the late John LaRose's Radical Black and Third World Book Fair, which was a must attend for many of our listeners? Um, I guess this is um, the next stage. I mean, that was, I think it's nearly 10 years ago. Um, things have slightly changed in the community. Um, people tend not to be as active as they probably were during when John LaRose was doing it. And we're trying to bring that back. We're trying to bring back the fact that, you know, reading and literature helps to enlighten people, empower them, open their minds to new opportunities, to new infinite knowledge. Do you think that um, in pushing the spoken word, the printed word, whether on paper or electronically, you're uh, swimming canute-like against the tide because everyone seems to be into the video you know, image, you know, the MTV base culture, the instant gratification, as opposed to words which many youngsters say, it's long, man, it's long. No, I think sometimes in the black community we often tend to underestimate how much we actually read. I mean, when I first started working at Centre Prize, we've got a bookshop there with the, you know, one of the largest collections of black literature. And you'd be surprised at the array of different types of black people that come in. Some of them who look like they've walked straight out of an MTV video and they're reading about philosophy, they're reading about their roots, and they know, you know, they know their stuff. So sometimes it's not judging people by, you know, they might listen to a certain type of music, but you know, if you're reading certain things, it starts to play. And you know, there's a big difference, especially recently, we've seen masses of black people people coming in and wanting to read about their history. What do you put that down to? Is it because we've now entered the month of October? No, before the month of October, from I'd say about, you know, from the beginning of the year, most book, you know, black book publishers have seen a massive difference. A lot more black people are wanting to read and I think that's got to do with a lot more education. We've got a lot of people who are saying, okay, the way that we're living isn't working, what can I do to change that? You know, it's as simple as that. We're moving into an era where it's all about, you know, spiritualism, 
ballrooms are like the number one selling books, yeah. And if you're gonna be into, you know, and most women are people who, you know, attend writers' courses and who read, and they always want, not all of them, but most of them want to increase their knowledge and their infinite wisdom and their spirituality. And Aren't science, most of them yeah? reading self-help help books though, sort of yeah. thing, Oprah type stuff, you know, no, and uh, Ayanna Van Zandt sort of thing. What you tend to find is when they read these books, they put seeds of, you know, seeds of different kind of aspirations into their heads and they start thinking, okay, if I want to achieve this, that means I need to know this. And it starts them reading a whole trail of books. So, yeah. So, in terms of the highlights of the uh, festival, we know we've already mentioned the Mutabaruka and Brada, but there must be so many more. Other people flying in from Africa, the Caribbean, and the homegrown. We don't want it to be like MOBO, where the homegrown gets ignored, and it's all about the people from overseas. No, we have loads of British writers participating. We have um, Malaika Booker, um, Beyonder, who's our artist in residence, and he's going to be working with young people. Um, we've got um, Snow. A whole range of uh, people. And how have you chosen um, those whom you deem fit and proper uh, for inclusion in this programme? And have you put some noses out of joint? No. By not including them? <laughs> No, no, it's always, it's always been about output, it's about the quality of output, I mean, you know, how good was, not just how good was their last book, but their actual, you know, history of publishing, you know, good quality work and working within their communities and being able to actually interact with the crowd. You've got some excellent writers out there who don't do workshops because they're not really into, you know, that kind of interaction. But you've got some people who are excellent at expressing the written words. So, yeah. And as production manager, I mean, has it been extremely difficult getting the money together for this? Because production managers, in the end, have to manage budgets and it's normally a headache. I mean, have you found that you're able to fly Anthony T. Browder in from the States, you know, first class or club <laughs> on BA or on American Airlines? I mean, what's it been like from that point of view? Because many people just see the celebrity or see the star. They don't know the headache, the financial and logistical headache that it causes to people like you? Well, I think one of the important things that we practice at Centrepies is that we do plan well ahead and we make sure that we have the funding in place and we're very realistic about what we can and can't afford and first class is something we definitely can't afford. <laughs> so, world traveller. <laughs> Air tours. <laughs> Please, I don't believe that, I don't believe that. Excellent, well I'm glad that you're in uh, fine fettle and in very good spirits. Um, just in a nutshell, your hopes for the next month? Um, we've got over 40 workshops and I hope to see um, you know, people of African descent and people of all different types of descents coming along and supporting this because um, I think it really would help to move the, you know, the community forward one more step to kind of embrace the fact that we do read, you know. It's that old saying that, you know, if you want to hide something from a black man... Put, put it in a book. <laughs> But, you know, you don't have to do that. We do read and we do write. And I think, you know, it's, I mean, this whole year has been about, you know, the abolition of slavery. And this is the slave of, trade. of the slave trade, sorry. And one of the things that we're trying to do, yeah, we're commemorating it, but we're also, we want to celebrate that, you know, the past 200 years of achievement, number one. And we also want to discuss how much did we participate in actually, you know, stopping the slave trade. So we're coming from a different perspective and we'd like people to interact with that. Donna Marie Glashen, festival coordinator, production coordinator indeed, of Word Power. Thank you very much, and we'll be talking to you and your colleagues quite a bit during the month of October. Thank you, Henry.